In quantum mechanics, a qubit is a two-level quantum system. These two quantum state could be spin up and spin down, herein denoted by the zero and one kets. The quantum mechanical state can be in a superposition of zero and one. The block sphere is a geometrical representation of the quantum state of a qubit. It is a unit sphere with the north pole representing the zero state and the south pole representing the one state. The block sphere provides a powerful visualization of the state of a qubit and is a powerful tool for understanding quantum mechanics and quantum computing. In this video, we will discuss the block sphere representation and show how it can be used to visualize the state of a qubit and to perform calculations. The general qubit is a linear combination of the ket 0 and ket 1, which are the orthonormal basis of the two-dimensional Hilbert space. Here, A and B are complex valued probability amplitudes. We will show how to express the same qubit in the block sphere representation, where the parameters theta and phi are the polar and azimuthal angles, respectively, in spherical coordinates. Hence, we will map the two complex amplitudes A and B onto the geometrical variable theta and phi. You might ask how could that be possible since A and B are complex, which will require four degrees of freedom to present their real and imaginary parts. But theta and phi, which are both real, will only constitute two degrees of freedom. What are we missing? What is needed are two additional constraints, which we will make clear in the discussion that follows. First, some very basic stuff about complex numbers, which you can skip if you want. Recall that any complex number z can always be written as the sum of its real and imaginary parts, which are each real numbers. This representation is called the rectangular form. This nomenclature is because we can represent the complex number z as a two-dimensional vector, with its real and imaginary parts represented by the real and imaginary axes. Due to this relation with two-dimensional vectors, the real and imaginary components are also called x and y. We can always switch from Cartesian coordinates x and y to polar coordinates r and phi where r is the distance from the origin and phi is the angle from the real axis. In polar coordinates, x is equal to, r cosine of phi and y is equal to, r sine of phi. Substituting this into the original rectangular form, and using the Euler's identity in the last step, we arrived at z is equal to r times e to the i phi. This is called the polar representation of a complex number. Now that we have shown that a complex number can be written in polar form, we go back to the original qubit. We replace the complex coefficients a and b with its polar representation, as, r a, times e to the i phi a and, r b, times e to the i phi b, respectively. Now, consider the qubit psi prime, which is the original qubit multiplied by a complex phase e to the minus i phi a. A complex phase that can be factored out is called a global phase. We will show that for all meaningful physical processes, a global phase can always be disregarded and only the relative phases of a and b matters. Consider the expectation value of any operator O with respect to the qubit psi prime. We can easily show that it is exactly equal to the expectation value of O with respect to the qubit psi. Thus, the global phase does not alter the operator's expectation value, which are the quantities that can be measured. With that in mind, we can simply let R A be a real number without loss of generality, and define a relative phase on the amplitude B as delta, which is simply the difference between phi A and phi B. Now, the qubit should still be normalized, so the sum of the square modulus of the coefficients is 1. Now, we rewrite the part with the relative phase in the rectangular form as x plus iy. Substituting this back into the normalization condition and remembering that, r a, is a real number yields us the following equation. Thus, here are our two constraints we mentioned at the beginning of the video only the relative phase of the amplitudes matter, and that the amplitudes must be normalized.
With this, we are now ready to do the mapping onto geometrical variables on the block sphere. Renaming the RA variable to Z, we get the known unit sphere equation. In spherical coordinates, x is equal to sine of theta times cosine of phi while y is equal sine of theta times sine of phi, and z equals to cosine of theta. Recall that we rewrote the complex amplitudes in a rectangular form as shown. We replace the x, y and z variables by their corresponding forms in spherical coordinates, and with some simple simplification, and the use of Euler identity, we finally arrive at a form like the block sphere representation. However, we are not quite there yet. Recall that in spherical coordinates, the polar angle theta has the range from 0 to pi. However, with the formula we obtain for psi, when we plug in theta equals pi, we get the basis state 0 with a minus sign. This is obviously not consistent with the block sphere picture, where we expect to arrive at the basis state 1 when theta equals to pi, or south pole. To get around this issue, we must replace the arguments of the trigonometric functions with the half polar angles. It's easy to see that now we get the basis state 1 when theta equals pi. Pause and check for yourself that what I said is true. Thus, we have finally show how to switch from the usual representation with A and B complex amplitudes to the block sphere representation with polar and azimuthal angles. Before we end the video, I would like to add another remark. We showed how to map elements of a two-dimensional space onto a three-dimensional representation. However, the mapping was done in a somewhat heuristic way. A more formal mapping can be motivated with group theory. Groups are sets with a well-defined multiplication operation between elements of the set that obeys a few properties. The property of closure, association and the existence of identity and inverse elements. A very important class of groups are the Lie groups. Lie groups are groups of continuous symmetries over smooth manifolds like spheres or the circle. Lie groups are ubiquitous in physics and two examples are the SO3 and the SU2. The first is the group of rotation matrices in 3D space and the second is the group of 2 by 2 unitary matrices with determinant 1. You can see that the first one relates to the actual 3D space where we visualize block sphere and the second is the space where qubit live. Although not apparent at this juncture, these groups are intimately related. In fact, there is a homomorphism between the groups. The generators of each of these groups are listed here as follows. Generators are the subset of a group that allows any other elements in the group to be expressed as a combination of elements of this subset and their inverses. You may notice that the generators of SO3 are very similar to the angular momentum operators in quantum mechanics, which is often referred to as the generator of rotation. The SU2 generators are just the Pauli matrices. The commutation relations that governs these two classes of generators obey the same form. In other words, both groups have the same algebraic form. We say that there is an isomorphism between the algebras of SO3 and SU2. An isomorphism is a correspondence or mapping that preserves the mathematical structures and can be reversed by an inverse mapping. Here, epsilon is the Levi Civita symbol. When two groups have the same algebra, we say that they are different representations of the same group. This shows that the qubit to block sphere mapping is very deeply rooted in the symmetries of the two groups. The mathematical details will be subject matter for another video. Stay tuned and subscribe so you will be notified of our future episodes.